Now, I get episode requests pretty frequently, which is awesome, because then half the work of finding all these games is done for me. And when I posted my Dragon Ball Z Super Butoden video back in January, I was immediately flooded with requests for people who wanted more Dragon Ball. And I am a man of the people, so that's why today I'm going to talk about six different Dragon Ball games from the 16 and 32-bit eras, starting with Buu Den for the Sega Mega Drive. Dragon Ball Z Buu Den, or Extreme Tale of Valor, was developed and published by Bandai for the Sega Mega Drive in Japan in April 1994. While the Super Famicom got seven different Dragon Ball games, the Mega Drive got just this one. The game is based on the Super Butoden playstyle, featuring big super moves, two planes of battle, and large arenas with split screen once you get far enough away from your opponent. The biggest adjustment is the control scheme since the Mega Drive controller has fewer buttons than the Super Famicom. In this case, A punches, B kicks, and C flies with no dedicated key button. Key attacks are performed by D-pad motions in tandem with the A button, similar to fireballs in Street Fighter. There are no shoulder buttons to dash either, so you have to double tap a direction in order to move around quickly. The game actually features an interesting cast with Goku, Gohan, Piccolo, Vegeta, Trunks, Cell, Number 18, Kuriden, Frieza, Rikum, and Ginyu, all with their own unique story modes. What I think is cool is that this is the only 16-bit fighting game to feature Kuriden as a playable character, which is one of the things I like most about this game. Everybody loves Kuriden. While Buu Retsden was released the same year as Super Butoden 3, it's much more similar to the original Super Butoden than its two sequels. It's not nearly as fast-paced as Super Butoden 3, or even 2 for that matter, suffering from a lot of the clunkiness that plagued the original Super Famicom release. The controls don't seem as tight either, as the special moves are difficult to pull off and you're often left flailing around as the computer opponent goes to town on you. The game features standard story and versus modes, although there is no Tenkaichi Budokai mode to let you play tournaments with more than two players. It's not a huge loss, but it is a little disappointing to lose it as it is a nice alternative to the basic versus mode. The game looks decent for a Mega Drive game, with good sized sprites that are actually quite colorful. They might not be super accurate colors, but they look good in a video game, and hey, that's what matters here. They don't hold up as well when you compare them to the characters in the Super Butoden series, but it's not a bad looking game considering all the tricks they're using to get it running so well on Sega's console. Interestingly enough, Buu Retsten did get a release in certain parts of Europe. Distributor Eco Films, Eco Filmes, changed out the cover and manual, leaving the cart intact, and released it in Spain and Portugal with a packed-in converter since the Japanese cartridge would not fit in European Mega Drives. A later French release used a European-style cartridge, and later Spanish and Portuguese reprints would use the French cartridges. The biggest issue I have with the game is the control. I love the Genesis controller, but it does Buu Retsden no favors here. The special moves are really hard to do, and like I mentioned before, the lack of buttons really hurts. The back of the box advertises that it's compatible with the 6 button controller, which is one of the best controllers ever made, but that's pretty much a lie. All it does is let you use the X button to select a random character, and that's it. It's kind of a waste. The music's not bad, although it's fairly forgettable. There are a few standout tracks, but nothing really reaches the status of the masterpieces in the Super Butoden games. And as a huge champion of the Genesis sound chip, that pains me to say. It's good stuff while you're playing, but it's nothing you're going to rush to put on your iPod or anything. Overall though, the game's not super great when you stack it against other Dragon Ball games of the era. It's a slower, uglier version of Super Butoden, and as a Sega fan, it really kills me to say that. It's neat to have as part of your collection, but it's not something you're going to go back to too often. The game isn't going to cost you very much money, with a complete copy running you anywhere from $20 to $30. I was lucky and managed to find a complete copy for $10 at a convention about 12 years ago, and I honestly don't know if I would pay too much more than that for it. Now, if you are going to try to play it yourself, you are going to need something like a Game Genie, because obviously the cartridge isn't going to fit in your American Sega Genesis. Now, it's not a terrible game, but it's not really a great one either, so I can't really recommend it unless you're a hardcore fan or you only have a Sega Genesis and not a Super Nintendo for some reason.
Now this leads us to an interesting period in time where the tail end of the 16-bit era and the dawn of the 32-bit era were overlapping. With Dragon Ball as popular as ever in Japan at the time, it only seemed natural that Sony's hot new PlayStation would get a piece of the action. And it did. With Ultimate Battle 22. Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22 was developed by Tosei and published by Bandai for the PlayStation in Japan in July of 1995. The first Dragon Ball game on a 32-bit console, Ultimate Battle 22 did a pretty good job showing off some of the neat tricks Sony's new baby could do at the time, especially since it was not considered a good console for 2D games. Showing off the advantages of a CD-ROM format as soon as you power on the game, you're treated to an impressive animated intro featuring all 22 of the game's playable characters. And that's actually why the game is called Ultima Battle 22. However, to unlock 5 bonus characters and bump the total to 27, at the title screen press up, triangle, down, x, left, l1, right, r1. Another animated movie will load showcasing the new fighters, and the title screen will now change to say Ultima Battle 27. The game's cast was massive for the time, and I'm not going to bother listing them. You can see them all right here. It's a good amount of variety pulling from every story arc of the series, and your favorite character is probably included. Unless you're crazy and your favorite character is a pool or something. The character sprites are super impressive, composed of hand-drawn cell animation from the show's animation team. While the game's low resolution and PlayStation's lack of 2D muscle keep them from being impressive in 2014, this was a really big deal at the time, and goes to show how much Tosei wanted to show off what they could do with more horsepower. The game does feature a little pre- and post-fight dialogue from the characters that will even change when different fighters face off. Unfortunately, these aren't animated nearly as well as the rest of the game, and everyone looks really off-model. But again, it was super impressive at the time, and if you ask me, they remain a big part of the game's charm. Ultimate Battle 22 ditches the split-screen aspect of previous games and instead will scale the camera in and out depending on how far away the characters are from each other. This does make the game feel a bit more fluid, but at the same time, it eliminates the grandeur of the big key attacks, plus the sprites aren't really drawn at a high enough resolution to be zoomed in and out so much, and they look kind of muddy as a result. Instead, the game focuses more on up-close combat, which is still pretty fun. A lot of the moves characters had in Super Butoden carry over here, so if there was a character you really liked in those games, you should have no problem carrying your skills over into Ultimate Battle 22. Ultimate Battle 22 gets a bad rap. You see, Atari released it domestically in 2003, eight years after it originally came out in Japan, and its age definitely showed. On top of that, they also took out all the cutscenes rather than replace them with redubbed audio. So then you have a game that's outdated and missing all of its charm and releasing it in the shadow of the PlayStation 2. So it's no wonder people didn't like it at the time. One other thing is the North American release adds dumb trademark and copyright symbols next to everyone's name and they just look horribly out of place. Just ugh. I love the game though. It's not nearly as bad as everyone says and I have a ton of fantastic memories with the game. When I was in high school, my buddies and I spent an entire summer on one of the game's coolest features, Build Up Mode. Build Up Mode allows you to save a character to your memory card and their moves will power up depending on how often you use them. So the four of us spent our entire vacation squaring off against each other with our custom fighters. Unfortunately, this mode is ripe for the cheese factor. Every character has a Meteo attack that does a ton of damage, and my buddy Antonio spent the summer leveling up Super Saiyan 3 Goku's unblockable teleport punch to the point where it was a one-hit KO. We didn't like playing with him that much. Overall, Ultima Battle 22 is definitely a bit clunky and hasn't aged terribly well, but it's still a lot of fun and worth checking out. It still looks and plays well enough, and the arranged versions of classic Super Butoden tracks make it a lot of fun to listen to to boot. Now, the North American and Japanese releases both typically go from anywhere from $5 to $15, but ignore the garbage domestic release and just pick up the import version, because then you get the cool cutscenes with the Japanese voice actors. And this is just a case of a game's reputation preceding it, and I can tell you that as a fan, the game is nowhere near as bad as the internet would have you believe, and you should check it out. But just be aware that it's not going to play on your American PlayStation, and you're going to need either a mod chip, or you're going to need to know how to hot swap your discs, 
or get something like this, just some kind of swap boot disk. It's worth it. Check it out. Now, while Buu Redstand didn't necessarily do a great job bringing the Super Butoden formula to a Sega console, luckily their next release, Shin Butoden for the Saturn, did. Now, this was the gold standard for Dragon Ball games for a long time, and in a lot of ways, still is. Dragon Ball Z Shin Butoden was developed by Tosei and published by Bandai for the Sega Saturn in Japan in November of 1995. It takes the graphic style of Ultimate Battle 22 and blends it with the gameplay mechanics of the Super Butoden series, creating what was, at the time, the best Dragon Ball fighting game yet. The game features 27 playable characters, and it's actually the exact same cast as Ultimate Battle 22, except you don't need to put in a code to unlock the 5 bonus characters. They actually reuse the same sprites in both games, and while that would give you the impression that this game is just a lazy rush job, it's anything but. Starting with the super cool animated opening, everything about Shin Butoden screams polish from the word go. The Ultimate Battle 22 sprites look even better here thanks to the Saturn's 2D muscle, as well as the fact that the game doesn't have them scaling in and out all over the place. They look more correct here than in Ultimate Battle 22, which is nice because it's actually doing the beautiful cell animation justice. The game returns to Super Butoden's roots, featuring two planes to fight on, as well as a split screen when the characters get far enough away from each other. This is both a good and a bad thing. It's good because it gives you some breathing room and lets you do the big key attacks that the series is known for, but it's bad because a lot of the stages aren't quite big enough to support it, so sometimes when you fly up your enemy will dash back and forth below you, over and over again, slowing things down and making it impossible for you to orient yourself. That's small potatoes though, because the pace of Shinbutoden is so much faster than previous games in the series that you won't be relying on your key attacks nearly as much. Fights are very quick, partly due to each character having a different size life bar, which you can change on the fight setup screen, and I recommend you do so, and partly because everything just moves so fast. Special moves chain together quickly, and if you don't know how to recover from getting knocked down, you'll get hit on the ground over and over again until the match is over. At first, this will get frustrating as you're getting used to the game, but once you get the hang of things, it becomes very clear that this is the apex of the Super Butoden series. One other neat feature is the ability to knock your opponent into different parts of the stage. You can knock them into the background, moving the fight into a new area that doesn't really add anything to the gameplay, but it certainly looks neat and is a nice way to spice up the fights. The game controls well, especially if you have the second iteration of the Saturn controller. The default controls aren't quite the same as Super Butoden, but you can change them to fit your preferences. I like to set dashing to the two shoulder buttons, rather than the default of one shoulder button plus the D-pad. It's what I'm used to, plus having to use two buttons in tandem to dash is extremely cumbersome for something that's supposed to get you out of a tough spot quickly. Shin Butoden's soundtrack is also another extremely high point, featuring remixes of both classic Super Butoden tracks, as well as some of the iconic vocal insert songs from the series, including Mind Power Key. In a way, this makes Shin Butoden feel more like a celebration of the entire franchise, rather than just the culmination of a fighting game series. And on top of everything else that's great about Shin Butoden, it's got probably the best mode in any video game ever. Mr. Satan Mode. Yeah, Mr. Satan Mode. Mr. Satan Mode is fantastic. Mr. Satan convinces 18 to take a dive at the Tenkaichi Budokai so he can continue to be adored the world over as everyone's number one champion. She agrees, but it's going to cost him. So to make all the zenny he needs in order to pay her off, he begins betting on and trying to rig other Tenkaichi Budokai matches. Before each round, you'll equip Mr. Satan with items like a gun, banana peels, flashlights, mines, and healing items that can be used to influence the fight. Once you place your bet on a fighter, you take control of Mr. Satan as he does everything he can to ensure his fighter wins. It's really goofy and fun, but appropriately hard, and it's a nice break from participating in the fights yourself. It's a shame that something like this hasn't shown up in any other games, but I suppose it keeps it special here. From top to bottom, Shin Butoden is a stellar offering for Dragon Ball fans. 
It controls great, it perfects the Super Butoden formula, and despite a few stumbles here and there, it offers some of the fastest and most fluid action of a 2D Dragon Ball fighter. The presentation is phenomenal with the gorgeous music and sprite work, and you simply can't say no to any game with a Mr. Satan mode. Now, Shin Butoden has gotten a lot more affordable in recent years, and you should be able to snag a copy for about $20. Just don't be taken in by people trying to sell a rare misprint copy, because as far as I can tell, they're all like that. To play it on your American Saturn, you will need something like the Action Replay Plus, but if you have a Saturn, you should have one of these anyway, because most Japanese games are cheaper than the American counterparts. But I digress, and you should absolutely pick up a copy of Shin Butoden if you have a Saturn. It's one of the best Dragon Ball games ever made, and it's affordable, and Mr. Satan mode. So with all this 32-bit goodness popping up and the PlayStation and Saturn sinking their claws into game players throughout Japan, it's probably safe to assume that Nintendo's dependable Super Famicom was probably done, right? Well, not quite. There was one more game to be released for a Nintendo 16-bit tank, and it was a doozy. Hyper Dimension for the Super Famicom. Dragon Ball Z Hyper Dimension was developed by Tosei and published by Bandai for the Super Famicom in March 1996. Rather than simply being Super Butoden 4, Hyper Dimension overhauled everything. Gameplay systems, roster, graphics, everything. To make a new, unique fighter that was a ton of fun to play and stood on its own far better than another sequel could have. So to everyone who asked me why I didn't talk about Hyper Dimension in my Super Butoden episode, it's because it's not a Super Butoden game. And I didn't have it yet, but I do now. So let's talk about it. The first thing you'll notice is how different the game looks. It's got a darker, shaded look that's unlike any other Dragon Ball game. The colors are more muted and everyone's got an actual fighting stance now, so right from the get-go, it's apparent that this is not a Super Butoden game. The next thing that you'll notice is that there's no key meter this time, which leads to Hyper Dimension's biggest innovation. Your life meter and key meter are the same thing. That means performing a Kamehameha or Super Ghost Kamikaze attack will drain your health bar, which sounds bad. But that also means that recharging your key refills your life, which is good. Charging up now has even more strategic merit because you're not just allowing yourself to perform a powerful attack, you're also potentially swinging the life meter in your favor. It's a super cool system that forces you to approach the game differently. You can fire off key blasts with reckless abandon, but if your opponent is smart enough, then all you're doing is whittling your health down without them having to lift a finger. It's super fun and engaging, and opens up a whole new level of strategy and mind games when you're playing with a friend. The game's cast is pared down a bit, featuring Goku, Vegeta, Gotenks, Gohan, Vegito, Cell, Frieza, Skinny Boo, Fat Boo, and Piccolo, but the roster actually feels quite varied and fleshed out. It's not overloaded on Super Saiyans like Super Butoden 3, which is nice, and everyone manages to control differently enough that they all feel unique. The game controls more or less like Super Butoden, but it swaps out the fly button for an extra attack button that can knock your opponent into different stages. Yeah, you don't get knocked to a different part of the same stage, it's like, all the stages are one big stage. It's really cool in practice, and knocking your foes around is really fun. You can send them to other areas by doing different commands, too. The game also adds a cool 3D attack you can do where you quickly dash into the background and then into the foreground again with a strong attack. This isn't just for offense, and if you time it right, you can dodge big attacks and counter while your opponent is still stuck in their attack animation. Carrying on the tradition of flashy Meteo Smash moves, Hyper Dimension features desperation moves you can perform only when your life bar is flashing red. These are huge, devastating attacks that not only look cool, but do tons of damage and can easily turn the tide of battle. The game's story mode doesn't follow a single character and instead just follows the plot of the series and switches who you play as accordingly. Plenty of liberties have to be taken due to the small cast of playable characters, but hey, story mode's there. The Tenkaichi Budokai mode also returns. You know how it works already. I really like how Hyper Dimension looks. It's got a great art style that deviates from the norm but still feels like Dragon Ball. They also animate extremely well, and some of the background effects are impressive even today. Hyper Dimension is one of the SNES games to employ an onboard helper chip to increase graphical power, in this case the SA-1 chip, which was also used in Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. Now, 
years ago, hyperdimension used to be a lot more expensive than it is now. Because back in the dark ages of the internet, when everyone was playing their Dragon Ball ROMs on emulators, no one had figured out how to emulate hyperdimension because of that SA1 helper chip. But that was like 15 years ago, so it's no longer an issue, and you can get a copy at a good price. I really, really like Hyperdimension. It's got a fantastic style all its own, and is different from previous games, but not just for the sake of being different. There's an incredibly solid game here, and when I was recording footage for this episode, I didn't want to stop playing. It was an incredible send-off for the Super Famicom, and definitely holds up as an incredibly enjoyable fighter today, even regardless of its license. So while Hyperdimension used to cost an arm and a leg, that's not really the case anymore, and you should be able to find a loose cartridge no problem for about $20. And in fact, I frequently see it pop up in a bundle with the Super Butodan series for really affordable prices. And if you do want to go for a boxed copy, it is going to cost you a bit more, going anywhere from $80 to $100. And that is a lot, but considering just loose cartridges used to hit that price, it's quite the deal. Now, it was just two months later that the 32-bit systems got another Dragon Ball game, and this time it was a multi-platform release. Idainaru Dragon Ballu Densets, or The Great Dragon Ball Legend, or just Legends as most fans call it because it's easier. This completely threw every formula from the previous games out the window and created a unique, innovative experience that was unlike any game that had come before it, or that has come after it. And for the record, I do have the Sega Saturn version, so that's the version that we're going to be looking at today. Idainaru Doragonboru Densets was developed by Tosei and published by Bandai for the PlayStation and Saturn in Japan in May 1996. Deviating greatly from the standard one-on-one -on -one formula, Legends puts up to six characters, three to a team, in a giant fishbowl arena allowing for a much greater movement and much, much greater potential for chaos and mayhem. With a title like The Great Dragon Ball Legend, it's a given that the game has a massive cast. 35 characters in all to be exact, although some of them are just different Super Saiyan forms of the same characters. It's nothing compared to the triple digit rosters of the games that are coming out on modern platforms, but believe me, in 1996 this was nuts. Each character has standard life and key bars, but there's a twist. Normal attacks don't drain health. Instead, they affect the power balance bar on the bottom of the screen that will fill up with the different team colors as the momentum of battle changes. Fill it up completely with your color and your lead character will perform a cinematic special attack that'll take off a chunk of your opponent's life bar. It's a super cool idea and definitely makes the fights feel more like Dragon Ball. Quick flurries of punches and kicks can chain into bigger combos, or huge kicks that send your opponent flying and you dashing after them to kick them away again. It's chaotic and crazy and super fast paced and it's definitely appropriate. The controls are a little weird too, but they fit the offbeat mechanics. The shoulder buttons will switch which character you're in control of and who they're targeting, and then you have block, attack, and key buttons. You don't have free movement, and instead pressing up moves you towards your opponent with down moving you away. It sounds clunky and confusing, but it works very well in practice. Also fitting the legend name, the game's story takes you through 8 stages, starting with a fight against Nappa and Vegeta, and ending with Goku and Vegeta's fight against Boo. What's really cool and keeps it from being another boring story rehash is that you're scored after each fight with how well you follow the plot. You have several characters at your disposal in any stage, and defeating the right enemies with the right heroes, and even letting heroes die when they should, increases your score. For example, following the plot in the fight against Frieza and letting him kill Kudadin will turn Goku into a Super Saiyan for the rest of the fight. Manga panels illustrate the events in between stages while the series narrator explains what's happening in the story so far. Even if you can't understand Japanese, it's a really cool way to present things, especially since they could have easily just slapped in a generic loading screen on there and called it a day. 
Characters will even talk back and forth during the screen where you can swap characters in and out, making it feel like they're actually watching from the sidelines. The game features a two-player mode, but I can't really recommend it. While the chaos works in one player, it works because the camera only needs to track the character you're playing as, so having a huge amount of distance between characters isn't an issue. In two-player, when both players need to be on the screen at all times, it gets really messy and hard to see. The game actually looks pretty good, all things considered, and while the sprites look sloppy and nondescript at first glance, they look great in-game because they scale well and you can easily tell who's who at all times. You don't need a lot of detail in a game like this, and the sprite-based characters on the polygonal environment is a neat look. While the PlayStation and Saturn versions are more or less identical, there are slight differences in the graphics. The Saturn has more rocks and trees littered about, while the PlayStation version uses more 3D effects on the special attacks. In the PlayStation version, Vegeta performs his trademark Final Flash and Big Bang attack, but the Saturn version has him performing a generic upwards key blast. Overall, the Saturn version plays a bit faster and is the version that most people seem to prefer, but you're not really getting short change if you go for the PlayStation version, which is actually noticeably easier. The biggest problem with the PlayStation version is that the game uses Redbook audio instead of streaming files, so if you're using the old school swap trick on your audio, it's going to be messed up. If you have a mod chip, a dedicated swap disk, or a Japanese system though, you'll be fine. My biggest complaint with the game is rather minor. With this much pomp and circumstance in the game about celebrating the series' history, the opening cinematic is completely phoned in, and is just downright ugly compared to the gorgeous intros to Ultimate Battle 22 and Shin Butoden. Legends is a really great game that's still held in high regard by fans. There's been a ton of Dragon Ball games, and there still hasn't been anything quite like it. While it hasn't aged perfectly, it's a ton of fun to play and is definitely a Dragon Ball experience unlike anything else. It's definitely worth seeking out, regardless of which version you get. One of the best things about Legends is how affordable it is, and you can grab a copy of either version for under $10. It's crazy not to seek it out at that price, even if you're just a little bit interested. And I do keep harping on how unique and different this game is, and that's just because it's so much fun to play and unlike anything else, that you definitely owe it to yourself to seek it out. Now from there, it was time to take Dragon Ball games into the next dimension. The third dimension. Let's talk about Dragon Ball GT Final Bout for the PlayStation. Dragon Ball GT Final Bout was developed and published by Bandai for the PlayStation in July 1997, in North America. This was a full month before the Japanese release, simply called Dragon Ball Final Bout. This was pretty monumental at the time. This was the first domestically released Dragon Ball video game, and no, Dragon Power for the NES does not count. And for it to hit North America first was a big deal. What was weird was the added GT on the end of the title. The Z-Series was just heating up here, and GT was still a long ways off, having not even finished airing yet in Japan. Like Ultimate Battle 22 and Shin Butoden, Final Bout has a cool animated opening showcasing the game's playable characters. My only complaint is that the game replaces the incredible Hironobu Kageyama vocal track, The Biggest Fight, with generic guitar butt rock, but alas, we couldn't have everything in 1997. Anyway, the game is the first to ditch 2D sprites and render the characters in 3D. They actually don't look that bad, especially for a game that came out 17 years ago. Although there are some things that just look weird, like Super Saiyan 4 Goku's tail that just looks like it's made of sausage links. Speaking of Saiyans, I hope you like them because this roster has a lot of them. The regular roster is rather bare, but luckily there are a few codes to beef it up a bit. At the title screen, press right, left, down, up, right, left, down, up. You'll hear a chime, then press triangle nine times and square nine times. You'll hear another chime and voila, more filled out character select screen. Now you can pick from Goku, Pawn, Kid Goku, Trunks, Vegeta, Super Saiyan Goku, Gohan, Cell, Boo, Frieza, Piccolo, another Super Saiyan Goku, Future Trunks, Vegito, Super Saiyan 4 Goku, Super Saiyan Kid Goku, and Super Saiyan Trunks. That is a lot of Goku. One bright spot on the roster is Pan, making her first and only playable appearance until nine years later in Sparking Neo, released domestically as Budokai Tenkaichi 2. 
The gameplay... it's a little rough. It's supposed to harken back to the Super Butoden days, but it's just really sloppy and clunky. The main problem stems from there no longer being just ground and sky planes, and now you can fly around freely by holding the shoulder button and using the D-pad. This causes all kinds of collision detection issues, because most special moves are designed to be combos, so the hits rarely connect properly. The nice thing is that the cinematic key attacks return, and they look really cool. They also have a lot more variation than in the older games, with some characters like Cell doing moves like outward explosions instead of just basic beams. But this also introduces the game's most glaring and charming inconsistency. The Dragon Ball dub was just heating up when the game came out in North America, so the voice cast used for all the pre- and post-fight quips don't match the show's cast at the time. And that's fine, but in battle the characters speak Japanese, so each character has two voices that they use at the same time. It's actually kind of funny. I won't lose to someone like you! What? It's already over? Now, I know I only talk about good games, and Dragon Ball GT Final Bout is not a good game. But I still remember in 1997 walking into that blockbuster and just it blew my mind to see that game on the shelf. I mean, it was a new Dragon Ball game being released in English. And I rented it over and over again and pff, I didn't even care how bad it was because I was just so happy to be playing it. The game holds a lot of nostalgic value for me in that sense, but I'm not going to pretend it's awesome or unappreciated. It's a mess, but it's still a fun mess if you know what you're getting into. The goofy voices mixed with the laughably horrid mechanics make for a good time if you've got a buddy around who loves the series as much as you do. One really high point is the game's music. It's got a nice mix of classic and original tunes, and they sound great on the PlayStation. Even if you don't want the game, the soundtrack is definitely worth seeking out. Now, the original printing of the game was limited to something like 10,000 copies, so a copy of that's going to run you about $120, which is nuts. But in 2004, Atari re-released it with this really ugly cover art, and you can get that for about $10, which is a lot more palatable. Just don't go into it expecting to have a good time by yourself. Even on easy difficulty, the AI is relentless. It'll hit you with medio combo after medio combo, counter every key blast, and basically just be a giant pain in the butt. The best way to win is to cheese them with special moves over and over again, which gets kinda old quick. You'll probably want to play with a friend, or versus man, as the mode select puts it. It's a neat game to have, but really, you're not gonna get much out of it if the game's dopey charm doesn't do anything for you. I like it, but I'm not gonna pretend that everyone's gonna feel the same way. There wouldn't be another Dragon Ball game released until 2002, when Budokai, known simply as Dragon Ball Z in Japan, came out for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube. Since then, there's been a new game every year, and they've all come out pretty much worldwide. With the game so readily available now, it's kind of a trip to remember a time when we didn't get any of them. So yeah, that's six Dragon Ball games in one episode, and I am tired. But at this point now, I've talked about every 16 and 32-bit Dragon Ball fighting game, and as someone who's loved the franchise for as long as I have, I've had a blast getting these games back out and talking to you about them. But before I go, I do want to give a special thanks to my awesome wife, Christina, for drawing these awesome eye-catch parodies, because it was another instance of a dumb idea that I had that she went along with. So, thanks, honey. Dragon Ball has been around forever, and with a new movie being confirmed to hit Japanese theaters in 2015, it's not going anywhere. There are tons of games now that take advantage of the horsepower of modern consoles, but I'll always prefer the simpler days. They're the games I grew up with, and I've loved sharing them with you. If you've got a way to play them, make sure to seek them out. No matter where the Dragon Ball franchise is going, it's always nice to take the time to remember and appreciate where it's already been.